optimal currency area literature, fiscal policy should help buffer asymmetric shocks that cannot be taken care uh, by the single monetary policy. EMU foresees that this is done by national fiscal policies within fiscal frameworks, within fiscal rules. It is currently, and for a couple of years, has been much discussed to what extent this, these national buffers should be supplemented by central fiscal capacity. Jean-Claude Trichet uh, this morning has referred to this, and this will certainly uh, going to be discussed tomorrow in session six. And Gottfried Haber is certainly uh, going to refer to this. A second uh, reason why uh, the interlinkage between fiscal and monetary stability is important is that fiscal policy is also a very powerful tool to, in to influence economic behavior through incentives. In other words, fiscal policy can also be regarded as a powerful tool of structural policies. Uh, which are needed uh, to make EMU uh, function smoothly, as Luis de Melio uh, emphasized this morning. In a way, EU structural and cohesion funds can be seen as part of this function, but uh, several economists claim that we need uh, more of this uh, in, a, uh, in the context of EMU deepening, while others claim that uh, a deepening in this sense might uh, risk to create uh, adverse incentives. A third reason why the interaction between uh, fiscal and monetary policy is important is that fiscal policy can support or threaten monetary stability. This holds both, both in normal times and in crises situations. Let me start with the normal times. For instance, pro-cyclical fiscal policy can make the ECB's task to achieve its price stability objective more difficult. So fiscal policy should use its space in downturns, but also consolidate during booms. Fiscal policy can also trigger, or at least aggravate, financial crises by, for instance, fueling asset prices that lead up to crises, by failing to create policy space during good times, or by accumulating excessive debt triggering a loss in credit or confidence during crisis. Ludko Shuknet is certainly going to deal with this second aspect in depth. Now, I'm very happy that we have two outstanding uh, experts and two major representatives uh, for this panel. I start out alphabetically with Gottfried Haber. Gottfried Haber is university professor, full professor at the Danube University of Krems. I got to know him better in the context of his role as president of the Austrian Fiscal Council. He's also active in various professional consulting activities for national and institutional activity, uh, institutions. And um, most importantly, from mid-July, Gottfried is going to become vice governor of the Austrian Central Bank. Ludger Schuknecht, we two have known each other for a very long time. I had the privilege to interact with you when you were at the ECB, at that time responsible for fiscal policies in the member states and for monitoring fiscal policies, if I remember well. Uh, now that I came across Ludger again, he had, after many uh, different uh, stages and many different jobs, meanwhile, in the German Ministry of Finance, among others, Lutka had just become Deputy General, uh, Deputy Secretary General at the OECD since uh, September 2018. And given your background and given uh, the role and the functions that you do in the OECD, you are ideally suited as well to talk on this important topic. With this, I hand over uh, to Gottfried Haber to start with his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I would like to give you some thoughts, especially on the fiscal policy part, because I think uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy are interrelated in a, a very strong way, not just from the direction of uh, fiscal policy and the fiscal part to the monetary stability, but also in the other direction as well. 
which I would like to point out with a slide in a few minutes. Uh, due to the complexity of the topic, I'm afraid that I will raise more questions uh, than I would be able to give answer answers because it's a very long ongoing discussion we observe here. It's uh, discussions we had uh, in the 1990s uh, concerning optimum currency area, rules versus discretion. Well, I'm wrong in fact. There are parts of the discussion going back to the 80s and earlier. For example, the famous 1985 uh, Rogoff paper on dynamic games between monetary and fiscal policy. So uh, it's not everything new what we discuss, but it has become even more important during and after the crisis. So let me just give you a brief overview of the things I would like to discuss. Uh, the outline for my presentation is uh, to talk a little bit about the strengthened fiscal framework because uh, the main issue we have here is um, how strict should be the rules we have to observe in the fiscal framework. I think there is no discussion that there have to be rules, but the question is complex or simple rules, strict or flexible rules, rules versus uh, capacities and discretion. So uh, let's uh, have a brief look uh, on the development of uh, this kind of rules. Then uh, the question is, do we observe increased fiscal discipline during and after the crisis? And uh, there is uh, mixed evidence, and I will just try to point out two or three uh, topics concerning that. Then the space for macroeconomic stabilization and uh, shock absorption instruments. There are three dimensions I would like to focus on. First of all, the national and international uh, levels the public and private levels. We had a very interesting discussion this, uh, this um, morning concerning the question if um, banks, for example, are private or public. I think you remember. Uh, and uh, uh, the third topic, uh, the extension of the EU shock absorber, meaning the discussion on common capacities and common instruments and the um, fulfillment and, and the completion of the unions we, we have not completed yet. So let's start with a, um, a few charts and figures on uh, general government gross debt and uh, structural bud budget balance. What you can see from here is uh, uh, the EU 28 and the Euro 19 areas. And uh, well, we see some kind of improvement in fiscal stability during the last years. But the main question is, does this improvement um, result from a stricter fiscal framework? So the first question to answer from the academic uh, perspective is, uh, do we have a stricter fiscal framework? And the clear answer to that is of course, yes. But uh, let me just uh, drop a few words on the problem associated with fiscal stability and fiscal rules. What we see from uh, several parts of the literature is that we have uh, a clear deficit bias. Uh, and that deficit bias is a trigger for the strengthens fiscal framework. It stems from several aspects. First of all, political business cycles. We have short-sighted uh, pro-cyclical uh, policies uh, in, in good times, for example. We have moral hazard problems and free rider problems. We have uh, informational asymmetry, we have lack of transparency, some kind of fiscal illusion could be present, or even biased official forecasts. So uh, just to talk about uh, the most important um, issues raised in the discussion. And uh, what could be possible ways uh, uh, to alleviate those problems? Well. We could try to improve the policymakers' incentives by raising reputational risks for, for non-stable policies, for example, or electoral costs. We could try to raise public awareness. We could try to uh, address fiscal illusion. We could uh, try to uh, ensure independent forecasts. Uh, we could uh, try to find independent expertise and, and that's the most important part, we could try to strengthen uh, fiscal rules and try to um, set up or even strengthen, if, if present, fiscal institutions, which are independent. So uh, what you can see from the original uh, idea is that there are fundamental imperfections 
And uh, in the 1980s, we had uh, the idea of that constraints imposed by market forces alone might either be too slow and weak or too sudden and disruptive. So that's the main rationale. We could question that rationale, but it's, it's the main idea behind uh, uh, fiscal stability rules we have in, in Europe in effect. So um, that's the main idea behind the no bailout rule. Uh, we know this rule didn't hold exactly, but uh, my personal view is that uh, it, it was correct to uh, adapt that rule. But it also shows that rules might be uh, subject to time inconsistency. And sometimes there might be a strong uh, uh, incentive to deviate from, from rules, which in turn is a major problem uh, in the face of a financial crisis we had because uh, it's uh, all about confidence, it's all about credibility, and if you too often engage in, in changing the rules, there's a problem that rules might be not credible enough. So um, we had the strengthening of the fiscal framework. Uh, and the crisis, I suppose, quickened the economic governance process of the EU. Just uh, to talk about a few of those, uh, who, some uh, instruments which are not on the slide, we had 1992, the Maastricht Treaty. We had 1997, the Stability and Growth Pact. And we had the first amendment in 2005. We had the second amendment uh, known as the Six Pack in uh, 2011. We had 2012, uh, the Fiscal Compact. We had 2013, the Two Pack, also enlarging the rules and the governance. And we had uh, then uh, a different uh, scenario or a different development, uh, increasing flexibility in 2015. And uh, as there are many people here from the banking and financial markets as well, it's, uh, well, in both systems uh, the same. Uh, even if you talk about banking regulation, yeah, we had some kind of standard approach in Basel II, we had the internal ratings-based approach, and what we saw in the last years was some kind of convergence where the standard approach is getting more flexible and more complicated and the internal ratings-based approach is getting more regulated and more standardized. So I think uh, whenever uh, we try to put constraints on the system, there is a basic trade-off between flexibility on the one hand and um, on the other hand, uh, uh, the the uh, bindingness and the effectiveness of the rules being in effect. So let's uh, go to the next uh, uh, point. Well, there is a rule of independent fiscal institutions and that's not self-marketing for the Fiscal Advisory Council or other IFIs. Uh, you saw some of the remedies, the potential remedies uh, stem from uh, curing asymmetrical information, giving independent expertise and so on, uh, obey the comply or explain principle, increasing market transparency, increasing uh, the cost of uh, being non-sustainable, which also means increasing uh, the incentive to uh, do the right thing. And um, so there is a very important part of the compulsory uh, official data and dis, uh, data um, uh, generation process and the, and the discussion. And I think that's really one important part because uh, the last 10 years or even more, we had the problem of uh, credibility, we had the problem of transparency, and uh, as the economist would say, uh, especially the economists uh, who come from uh, economic policy optimization like Fritz Beuys and others, we would always say it's important to include the relevant variables uh, into the objective function of the policy makers. So uh, being more transparent is always a good idea. Uh, that means that if you want to um, have this setting, you need to obey some of very boring, um, and I won't go into the details, um, aspects uh, in, in, uh, the, for the conditions of the effectiveness which means independency, which, me, which means official information, and so, so on and so on. But um, is there some evidence that um, there is an, a, a positive impact if we have this kind of information and discussion? Well, there are different papers. Uh, I just would like to mention a few of those who show 
that there could be an impact if there are institutions and rules, but some of the papers suggest that uh, that does only work, or at least is um, empirically significant, if there are special effective rules. It, it, it isn't enough to have the institutions, and it isn't enough to have any rules. You have to have effective rules. So that's the bottom line of uh, some body of literature um, I would like to mention here. Uh, in fact, you have a trade-off between simplicity and effectiveness. And uh, the most interesting part is uh, this uh, chart shows you uh, on the one hand an, an optimal rule, which uh, is, let's say, elaborated and flexible, or a simple rule. And on the other hand, you have a benevolent government or uh, a government with deficit bias. And what you can see from this chart is that uh, especially if you have a stringent, simple rule, that means uh, it may lack political durability because, because it's too strict and too simple. Um, it leads to less deficit bias, but it might lead to suboptimal policy because it might be too binding. On the other hand, an optimal rule uh, in, in combination with a deficit biased governance might lead to uh, higher deficits. That's the hypothesis from theory. So let's go into uh, some um, empirical uh, evidence as well. So um, when we uh, have, uh, when we want to have effective fiscal rules, uh, there are some criteria defined in the 1990s and there's uh, some newer body of literature as well, showing that they have to be well defined, transparent, simple, sufficiently flexible, adequate uh, to the final goal. They have to be enforceable and consistent and underpinned by structural reforms. Uh, so I would uh, like, uh, would tend to say, you wouldn't find such a rule. So you have, you have to have a trade-off. And, and the trade-off always means simplicity versus effectiveness and flexibility. Uh, so, one aspect to mention uh, here again is the no bailout. Uh, you have to have credibility that there are no, or at least not too much external effects and uh, problems of free riders. So let's uh, go to the evidence if rules work or not. Yeah. Evidence is too strong. We don't have evidence uh, even if we uh, look at those topics for 30 or 40 years. But what you can see in the left panel is the increase of number of uh, numerical rules uh, within the uh, EU member states, uh, differentiated by type. The budget balance rules are getting more and more important from the number of rules. What about the compliance? The right panel shows uh, the number of EU countries under the excessive deficit procedure, uh, which seems to be declining. But of course we know there is a Ceteris Paribus problem. Of course we know it's, it's a special um, stage of the business cycle. Uh, so it might be possible that rules work. At least we have more rules and less excessive deficit procedures. Uh, the impact of rules on fiscal discipline is not well decided in the literature. Uh, for example, uh, we see that unconstrained discretion might lead to um, less public sector solvency, or uh, we, we, we see that uh, there is a real kind of problem because um, there might be also a publication bias. Because uh, w when, when we tend to do publications on such topics, it's always better if you have significant results. So if the result is that something is not significant, it might not be published. So to be very honest, there is no clear-cut evidence on the exact type uh, of the optimal rule. And uh, I'm afraid that this is still some kind of political um, um, uh, decision still. What we also see is uh, that, um, for example, high debt levels and uh, very weak compliance and lax enforcement uh, might be calling for stricter regulation on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, there is a position in literature showing that uh, strict rules might be fine, but um, 
the rules should not be engaged in micromanagement, not try to uh, even out every small deviations and, and, and volatilities, but uh, to be able to cope with the big issues. And that's also very hard. From my personal view in the Fiscal Advisory Council, we always see that uh, the complex rules we have with the two-pack and six-pack are not always very easy to administer and to understand. Uh, on the other hand, uh, well, it's due to the need for flexibility that they have become so complicated. The problem is that if you have, for example, the stability and growth pact rules, very simple, 60% of GDP public debt, 3% deficit. Or let's say the first amendment with uh, a long-term medium of objective of uh, a balanced budget. The problem is that we tend to use the capacities and that there is a deficit bias. Also a strict and binding rule wouldn't prevent anybody from not getting, not squeezing out the last pieces from the rule, but it's very hard not to do so. So what I would like to, to show you is the fiscal stance of the Euro Area 19. Um, this chart shows if we have counter-cyclical or pro-cyclical policies from the budgetary point of view. And what you can clearly see is that there is a bias towards the red field, and that means pro-cyclical. I know that's not very strict empirical evidence. It's just to give you an, let's say, optical hint on the topic. We could try to compare that with uh, OECD countries excluding the EU countries. There might be some kind of hypothesis that uh, these countries have less binding rules in effect than the EU countries, well, an ad hoc hypothesis. If you look at that, there's uh, yeah, one deviation for 2009, which could be a, a time lag effect, but in fact uh, also with uh, presumed less rules or less binding rules, you still have uh, pro-cyclical policies. So um, there is not very strong evidence from that that there is uh, a significant change. Other studies suggest, um, which uh, is shown here, that you have a trade-off between promoting fiscal discipline and permitting macroeconomic stabilization, which is uh, some kind partly a no-brainer because if you're more constrained, you cannot stabilize as much. But of course, it's more difficult than I uh, try to show here. Um, what might be also interesting is that um, the problem with structural budget balance rules and expenditure rules is that they limit automatic stabilizers. And um, there is also some literature on the question if uh, there should be more rules or more room for discretion. And what we find is that um, rules are too strict, uh, binding strictly the automatic stabilizers, there might be uh, less favorable results than in other scenarios. So could there be some national shock absorber? That's the third part of the topic I, I wanted to, to discuss. First of all, um, the question is, is there fiscal space? We have automatic stabilizers, we have discretionary fiscal policy, and uh, what we see, interestingly, is that uh, fiscal multipliers uh, tend to be higher in recessions. So there might be also an asymmetry concerning uh, different rules. The growth-friendly structural reforms uh, tend to create fiscal space. So what you see is we, we cannot um, distinguish completely the question of, of financial stability, monetary stability, and real economic policy. So that's the third part to take into account. Uh, uh, and it also means that uh, existing fiscal space should be used, at least that's a pro proposal which I would support for structural reforms and for boosting long-term um, growth. Now I would like to drop a few words on the effect I mentioned that um, monetary policy also has huge effects on, on fiscal policy and fiscal space. Uh, there are, for example, for Austria, different estimations for a little bit different time spans uh, on the effects, the interest savings for the government budget, which uh, reach from 
2.5 billion to 35 billion. To be honest, uh, it's for uh, twice the time, but uh, there are huge differences. The problem is you, you, you have to, dis um, to decide upon which is the calculation basis, which is the alternative scenario. But we see that there are huge, um, huge numbers, in fact, which also can tend to go to the different direction if interest rates change. So um, I, I would emphasize this transmission channel as well. And um, that also means that macroeconomic uh, stabilization and shock absorption instruments in the EU and uh, the euro area are present. There's the stability and growth pact, there is the ESM, there is the EU budget. Of course, it's uh, also now, it's, it's some kind of fiscal capacity, but very limited. We have national fiscal and regulatory buffers, but we have also in the non-fiscal policy area, we have uh, financial union, banking union, capital markets union, macro prudential supervision. All these uh, factors also um, influence the fiscal stability and uh, the uh, sovereign budget. And of course, monetary policy measures, targeted long-term refinancing operations and, and uh, the asset purchase program and so on. So um, the newer literature tends to identify three different channels of transmission uh, to absorb public and private shocks. That's uh, uh, the savings channel, that's the factor income channel, and that's the inter-member state um, fiscal channel. So um, if there are imbalances, all of the three channels could be affected, and that makes it different because uh, there could also be the effect that uh, one of the channels um, some kind of uh, disguises uh, the overall effects. Are there additional stabilization and shock absorption instruments necessary? So that's the uh, provocative last slide I would like to show you uh, and not answer because I think I, I have tried to give you some indications on arguments in pro, pro and contra. In fact, what we see is that uh, common risk sharing mechanisms uh, can be effective against asymmetric shocks. So um, that there are some proposals in the discussion, rainy day funds, reinsurance for unemployment insurance systems or uh, operational debt restructuring frameworks, common safe um, assets or strengthening of the, uh, of, of the European Monetary Union concerning the European Monetary Fund, enhancing the ESM, and so on. On the other hand, we see that um, if uh, the cause and the, the, the person or the state responsible for imbalances might uh, be the beneficiary of external effects and free rider um, mechanisms, there might be a deficit bias. So as I promised, I promised you not to answer the questions, but to raise the question. And so I think uh, I could keep the promise. Uh, the problem is also with risk sharing, that risk sharing has two sides. The one side is you have additional stabilization facilities, and the other side is that you might increase free rider problem, external effects, and public good characteristics, uh, leading to moral hazard and so on. So to conclude, uh, fiscal stabilization is very important because uh, it's also uh, touching systems like the pension system or other systems related to uh, the trade-off between present and future. Uh, we have uh, some improving of the quality of public finance, which we have observed, and it's, uh, it's key to structural reforms as well. And from a long-term perspective, uh, the institutional framework is very important. My personal view is that there might be simpler, uh, less complex rules, which might be, yeah, that's the downside, where might be more strict enforcement of these rules. But that's one of the provocative theses I would put, would like to put into the discussion Thank you very much. Uh, the central fiscal capacity will be subject to our discussion. Thank you.
thank you, Gottfried, um, also for this time discipline that you showed. We switch immediately to Lutke's uh, perspective on the link between fiscal financial vulnerabilities. Yeah, thank you very much, Ernest. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, and thank you for the invitation also to Jakob. It's good to see old friends. It's nice to see colleagues. Um, the work I'm presenting here is mainly from my previous life. Um, now at the OECD, I'm responsible for taxes, education, statistics in Africa, so it's a bit of a different story, but uh, it still holds me firmly in its grip. So we have uh, heard today that um, uh, public debt is high, perhaps too high, too high at least from the perspective of, uh, you know, providing enough buffers for economic stabilization uh, to under kind of to support mo and facilitate the life of monetary policies and not burden it with the risk of fiscal dominance. But we also have a debate now that says that public debt is basically irrelevant and if not irrelevant, at least less relevant and we should use uh, some more fiscal policy room to stimulate demand. What I would like to look at is um, the fiscal, the risks for the fiscals, for, for public finances that could arise from the financial sphere that have to a significant extent also already in the past uh, arisen from the, phys, uh, from the financial sphere. And um, what I would like to start with is uh, with a risk map um, with five transmission channels or, um, where, uh, so to speak, fiscal costs could arise from financial developments, from, uh, from developments uh, of asset prices, of financing conditions, and of balance sheets. And uh, these are basically the five channels. And uh, this is, so to speak, the details. I'm going to go through much of this. So we look at the direct effects on public finances from financing conditions and asset price effects first, and then look at uh, real economy channels, banks and shadow banking, central banks and international transmission. Um, it's, it's a field where, to my mind, as my as Gottfried said, you know, there's, it's, there's still a lot of questions, so I don't know whether I'll have good answers, but uh, certainly uh, you, those who know me will find some of the findings um, familiar. Um, st let me start with the fiscal side itself. Um, Martin had mentioned the fact that public debt today, 10 years after the crisis, is significantly higher than before. For the G7 countries, average debt is about 120% of GDP, which is roughly the same level as right after World War II. Um, Japan now at almost 240% is the leader of the pack, but we have a number of countries well above 100 within this group and outside this group. And um, we know that in the previous financial crisis, public uh, fiscal Fiscal crisis, in a way, made the financial crisis really bad, and uh, in some cases, public debt much lower than this, together with financial sector difficulties, uh, caused uh, markets to doubt the um, uh, government's ability to bear the fiscal burden. Where, where does the much higher debt come from? Of course, it was the effect of the crisis related to either bailout costs and other effects that I'm going to discuss. Um, but also the fact that in the last couple of years, when there has been a lot of talk about austerity, there hasn't really been any, at least in most of the countries. Um, uh, the, in this rather complicated, um, sorry, complicated table, I think you can see that in the last, uh, between 17 and the projection for this year, only uh, the UK is doing any fiscal consolidation. If you look a bit Further back, 15, 16 as well, then you have Japan, Ireland, and Portugal doing so as well, but the other countries on this list uh, did not do any. So in a way, uh, the fact that we haven't m got much of a buffer in public finance is not much of a downturn in debt is related to this. But let me turn to the real objective of my, my presentation. Um, what could burden public finances from the financial sphere? 
First, you know, there is the effect from potentially higher financing costs. I mean, some may argue central bank interest rates will stay at zero or around zero or near zero for the time to come, but spreads for governments can still significantly rise. And if like you have refinancing needs like well over 20% of GDP for Italy, Japan, or the US, then you know, interest rate changes in financing costs can have quick, significant effects on budget balances. And in effect, m a significant share of the deficit reduction in many countries in recent years was due to lower financing costs, and some of this could reverse. I can, could give you simulations here now, but I mean, for Japan, if you assume a 1% higher uh, interest rate, you know, just the one-year effect is 0.4% of GDP. So that's not insignificant, and that would accumulate over time if higher financing costs prevail. The next effect is less well known, even though it's been discussed by earlier work I've done myself, or the BIS, or some other authors of the OECD as well. And that is the effect from asset price changes on public finances, on fiscal balances. These asset price changes work through wealth effects on consumption. They work through capital gains effects on taxes through transaction taxes, but these effects uh, are quite significant and they have embellished fiscal balances preceding the previous crisis uh, by a significant amount and there is a risk that fiscal balances today already may be embellished by high asset prices. We've done a kind of rough calculation for Germany, um, but here on the right of this uh, chart of this um, uh, slide, you can see normally in downturns, revenue ratios should be roughly uh, stable in terms of GDP because revenue fluctuates with GDP. But you can see here that in the case of Ireland and Spain, in the context of the financial crisis, revenue ratios went down hugely because they had big revenue windfalls in the boom periods that then collapsed. And if you look at three or six percent of GDP, 1.2 in the case of the UK is much less, but it's not negligible. So that's this kind of channel. It can be uh, quite significant, especially when you take it together with the effect that then automatic stabilizers exercise on budgets. Um, the larger the size of government, the bigger the size of automatic stabilizers. We know that the financial, uh, when, when you have re repercussions on the real economy from the financial channel through confidence effects or financing cost effects, they can be huge. We've seen that in the financial crisis. Um, now, what people do not have much on their radar and what can be very significant as well is government guarantees and public-private partnerships. If government guarantees and public-private partnership arrangements are bellwether arrangements, which rely on a continuation of good economic conditions and so on, then suddenly in a crisis situation, you can find yourself with big losses from guarantees and from PPPs that you hadn't anticipated. We have ample cases of that, especially in emerging countries, but also some of the countries affected by the financial crisis were, uh, uh, um, were experiencing that. Now, the third channel is the financial system itself. First, the banking side. If you look at buffers, you know, financial vulnerabilities only arise, you know, if, so to speak, buffers are low and buffers are not used. So buffers have increased, capital has increased, and uh, we have increased um, requirements for bailable debt, liquidity and funding requirements, uh, resolution plans, uh, so we have made an, a lot of con uh, progress in the uh, international sphere uh, on this in the last 10 years. Um, there is also documented progress in the implementation by, FS by the FSB, in the FSB reporting. But implementation on some of this is still uh, to be proven. And in some areas, um, you know, where especially banking sector bail-in, banking resolution, uh, we have had quite a discussion over implementation being lacking. In addition, we have huge vulnerabilities. Non-performing loans is the, well, the most well-known part of this, you know, and if you see, look at uh, non-performing loans uh, in Greece and Cyprus, this was N17, I think we're a bit lower now, but even double-digit numbers in other countries is, is really uh, still, still an issue for concern because, you know, given the fact that capital is 
typically only maybe, uh, you know, you have a leverage ratio of three or four, or three or four percent of the balance sheet, and here you have non-performing loans of 10 percent. So just, just as an orientation. And um, as Martin was saying, corporate debt is high. We've had globally um, a significant increase in corporate indebtedness since the financial crisis. These numbers are a bit wild. Uh, don't focus too much on them in detail, but uh, if, I don't know whether there's a pointer here, never mind. You see the bottom line, um, in 2007, the average indebtedness was 94%, now it's 107. And in the column on the right hand shows you the debt overhang in a number of countries relative to the European benchmark of 80% of GDP for corporate debt. And there you can see that there are quite some countries which are much higher. Um, another uh, risk is, uh, the, yeah, is from the exposure of banks to government paper itself. Now here we have basically thrown all our good uh, intentions into the wind and uh, said government debt is uh, without risk. And theoretically uh, and you know, ideally that is true, but um, we all know that the perception of that can at least change very quickly. And we have 30% um, of Italian, Spanish, and Japanese government debt on bank balance sheets. In another group of highly indebted countries, France, Canada, Belgium, this is around 20%. So this is a huge number. And if you then look at banks, I mean, in Italy, it's up to 800% of the capital of banks that are the exposure of, that, of, of banks to uh, government debt. And um, that, of course, is a huge concentration of risk Moreover, we have defined that certain liquidity uh, conditions, you know, the, the fulfillment of liquidity requirements is linked, is, can be done with government debt, which in extreme situations in crisis may, of course, not be very liquid anymore. So government debt on bank balance sheets is a, in a way, a, um, yeah, a real challenge if debt is very high in particular. But I think even in a country like Germany, where the number is almost as high as in Italy, it's the question whether banks should be really so exposed to a single, um, a single debtor. Links with in Italy are particularly intense. You can see here that the increase in public debt by one third nominally between 2010 and 2018 was mainly absorbed by the Bank of Italy, but by monetary financial institutions as well and other resident financial institutions. So um, whereas the non-resident share of uh, f government debt holding has uh, declined uh, quite a bit. But it shows that um, here we have uh, an issue um, of exposure. This is the exposure of other countries to Italy, um, also on the basis of BIS data, uh, where especially France is highly exposed to Italy to the order of, I think, almost 300 billion. Um, the Banking sector vulnerabilities or the financial, the fiscal risks from the banking sector are relatively well understood. And there's also a bit of empirical literature on that. I will come back to that in a minute. But the vulnerabilities from the shadow banking sector for market-based finance are much less well understood. At least I haven't seen anything seriously discussing this. The IMF, um, of course, points to it. IMF, GFSR, the BIS is, uh, is also very uh, active in pointing to this. The OECD, we have in our finance department uh, some uh, publications that deal with this. Perhaps the most interesting number is here are from the, of the total debt of uh, um, almost $200 trillion. Half is in the broadly defined shadow banking sector and half of that again is considered uh, volatile uh, subject to potential run risks. So, you know, if you have money somewhere in the banking book that is held to maturity and nothing will happen no matter what, you know, that is not really an issue. But if you have money in with asset managers which may sell, you know, at uh, the moment of certain price changes, you know, and that it may become uh, turn into runs, then you have an issue. And, it, you know, the BIS at sees, sees 50 trillion or uh, 60, 70% of global GDP subject to these run risks. 
But also in non-bank financing, buffers have improved, even though I must admit that I was much less able to find good information on this. Uh, we have the agenda for systemic insurers, which have good capital uh, today. We have a G20 agenda for shadow banking, which has been agreed. Uh, the, I'm not sure the operationalization by EOSCO has been agreed. I think so, but implementation, I don't know where we stand on that. Um, we have progress on the bank exposure to shadow banking to limit spillback risks from shadow banking to banks. But, as I will show later, we have still a huge exposure through international channels of the banking system to international uh, bonds. Um, so the main risk in the shadow banking sector is snapback risks when interest rates or spreads suddenly rise, and then you have potentially runs from high-risk uh, debt or high-risk countries. And with the way today things are traded automatically and um, in funds, uh, this may have uh, unintended, unexpected spillover effects and regulatory cliff effects may also worsen this in the sense that um, we have uh, a lot of debt issued just at investment grade, triple B, and you get downgrades, you know, then you, you, you're likely to see a lot of, of, um, a lot of things happening. This is also described in the literature, but kind of the potential fiscal risks, first financial risks, ab ab risk absorption capacities, and then fiscal effects, this I haven't seen anything uh, decent on. The biggest risk, to my mind, the big biggest potential fiscal costs, however, are, to my mind, likely to rise from the pension fund industry in the broad sense. I mean, there is some OECD work, which I haven't put up here, but there is a very good study by Rao from 2018, which finds that for the US alone, the underfunding, according to current, so to speak, liabilities, asset liability matches, is 20% of US GDP. For the UK and the Netherlands, this is not small either. Uh, the UK in particular, it is also high, but especially in an adverse scenario, the funding gaps in the UK and Netherlands could be 60 or 80% of GDP. Now, then, in principle, especially in the Netherlands, defined contribution kicks in, so you have lower pensions which absorbs some of that. But this, this shows you, for instance, that in the Netherlands or in Denmark, there's almost 200% of GDP in pension assets. So if you have big asset effects and so on, you might, you might see these underfunding to become more visible. Um, but my hunch is, as it was said in earlier discussions, you know, if there's a pension fund crisis, it will be very difficult for governments to say, well, you know, sorry, I mean, we let the fund go under or uh, yeah, the industry can only pay 3% of GDP in benefits instead of 6 so, you know, consumers, please go ahead, absorb, uh, retired people, absorb the losses. So, so um, while hopefully some of this absorption would happen, it's not clear how much and how it would affect in a compound manner. This is the point that I'd made on, on low-quality corporate debt. Not only has the corporate debt market tripled in size, but also over 50% of corporate bond issuance today is at triple B, which you know is just above investment grade. And then, you know, when this is downgraded, you get these, all these forced disinvestments. And from the financial crisis, we know that 10% of all triple B debt at that time was downgraded below investment rate. Now, how the future will look, we don't know, but it's certainly a risk to assess. On top of it, a lot of this debt is covenant light. That means that uh, creditors uh, will, may find, find themselves in a surprise that they cannot uh, recover losses as easily as they thought and foreclose as easily as they thought. So the effect on creditors may be even more significant and then there if, you know, that may trigger additional runs or additional kind of uh, uh, overreaction or strong reactions by investors. Um, risk of central bank losses, I'm not going to go into details there. This is a very um, a minefield, but um, you, know, if, and, you know, if you look at the numbers, I also put them up to show that the numbers in Europe are really actually quite small compared to Japan or the US. 
Um, Italy only has, holds 500 billion, Germany less than 400 billion on its balance sheet. Um, but still, as a matter of fact, you know, if there were fiscal difficulties, central banks would have to incur losses, you know, we'd have that discussion on whether, you know, capital is enough, negative equity is possible, recapitalization is needed, and that's in an environment where perhaps the losses come from the own government. So this is, this is an element in the chain where we always think of the central bank as stabilizers, buying assets, sure, you can do that, probably unlimited in principle, but in reality, at least it's a reputational issue if you at some point are faced with losses. Finally, the international channel. Um, this is the uh, one side of it, more international credit. We see here the international credit today is almost 40% of global GDP. Uh, bank loans, roughly half of it. International debt securities, more. Five trillion of this held by banks. So it's a huge uh, possibility for, in a way, contagion through this spillback effects and for, in a way, cross-border effects from problems in one country uh, spilling over into another. Um, we have, if we look at international buffers, not vulnerabilities, we have the international safety nets from the IMF, the ESM, regional agreements, ad hoc swap lines, ad hoc bilateral support, and um, that's good, that's a buffer. Um, at the same time, we also find that the programs, the financial support programs, seem to be becoming ever bigger. I've only looked at a sample of them for the last 25 years. The kind of the group in the 90s, which was not the smallest programs, which were typically much bigger than the African uh, or uh, Asian programs of the 80s, were between 3 and 8%. Now we are typically in double-digit territory which to my mind also shows the greater international independence as well as uh, simply the greater size of financial sectors. Hence the debate on the if sufficiency of the size of global safety nets. Now then the question of the compound effects. How do all these channels work together? Um, that's a very difficult question. Um, I put up First, just to, it's not really a slide on compound effects. I put up the numbers that the IMF published in 2015 on the FIS, just the, the, the impact of the banking crisis. And we found that um, the, the, the case of Spain, it, the costs were only 4% of banking assets. So that's actually relatively low. But in the case of Greece, it was 33. So if you look on the right side, that's the costs of the crisis, just the financial rescue costs uh, between 4 and 33 percent, so there is, is, is not much of a pattern there, uh, uh, but it can be huge. Um, but I think this is a, perhaps a good chart of the compound effects of the, so to speak, the fiscal implications in the last crisis, and that's the increase in the debt ratio. You can see here that Ireland had reduced its public debt to 25 percent of GDP, and the crisis with all its you know, interactions and the different channels, uh, raised debt to 120% of GDP. The effects were a little less dramatic in Portugal and Spain, but another 60% of debt you know, really I mean, brought basically Portugal to, to the IMF and the ESM. And even the UK had an increase of almost 50% of GDP through the various channels. And um, if you look at these numbers and link them up with the debt ratios we have today, and uh, so then, you know, perhaps we are happy we have uh, better buffers, better buffers in the banks, internationally better buffers, hopefully also better buffers in the non-banking sector. But it should be a warning in the sense that debt does matter and we should perhaps also have fiscal buffers that are commensurate and can live up to the future challenges. So the literature has focused mainly on the financial sector. There, you know, I mean, it, in a way, it summarizes quite, uh, on, the, on the banking sector, sorry, um, it summarizes quite well what mattered for the costs of the banking crisis, for high debt, weak financial institutions, and regulatory failure. Uh, so I think these principles have not changed. Um, 
What I have not seen so far is a good discussion on circuit breakers. We have fragmented discussions on safety nets. We have discussions on, yeah, we have action on, say, capital controls in Cyprus and Greece, in some emerging and developing countries. But we do not have kind of a systematic discussion on, so to speak, if we have these uh, interactions across different transmission, transmission channels, is there maybe, are there maybe good circuit breakers? Are there bad circuit breakers? Uh, how, how, how should we govern these circuit breakers? And um, that, I think, is, is another interesting subject linked to this. Because you could also see, say, prolongation. I didn't put that down here. You know, instead of having a debt restructuring, you can have a standstill. A standstill is a circuit breaker. Uh, capital controls are a circuit breaker, but they can be a kind of a, 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 a fire accelerator if others then start reacting to the capital controls of one country, but if they are done in an orderly fashion, it could also help to work as circuit breakers. Um, so there's, there's various elements here that one could think about, uh, that, or that to my mind we should need to think about how if, if we ever get into a situation of great volatility again, how we gain the time, how we buy politics the time, how we buy markets the time to adjust in an orderly manner if needed. So conclusions. We have to understand fiscal financial risks and vulnerabilities better, especially compound effects and non-bank risks are, to my mind, pretty well, not, not well enough understood, the role of circuit breakers neither, and then the usual recommendations you would, you'd expect, I think, after such a discussion uh, is uh, uh, increase fiscal buffers and make sure that financial sector buffers, rules and regulations are well, well implemented. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ludger. We have now 10 minutes, uh, say, for questions and answers. Uh, does anybody want to use the opportunity to uh, Yes, please. Could we have a microphone, please? Thank you. Carl Pichelmann, European Commission. Uh, I have a question to both speakers, uh, and that is, uh, I mean, would you agree that uh, any mature, and here I would like to stress the word mature, economic and monetary area uh, will need an area-wide safe asset? Uh, and the second question, perhaps specifically to uh, Mr. Harbour, is on the question of, uh, of, of the symmetry of fiscal rules. I mean, you have uh, spoken a lot about deficit bias, and, uh, and one of the implications is that most of our fiscal rules are asymmetric. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, now, I mean, there may be a possibility, actually, that uh, governments may spend too little. <laughs> uh, uh, so would you agree that, uh, say, a reasonable steady state rule should be I mean, more symmetric than existing ones? Stefan Gerlach had a question. So I'm Stefan Gerlach from EFG Bank. I find that I agree with all, all speakers here, actually, uh, today, which is a little bit uh, unusual. But there is an element of disjointedness in this, uh, in this discussion. So if I start with M Martin Wolf's assertion, which I think is quite right, which is that interest rates have fallen across the world. Long real interest rates are to me the most important ones, and they have fallen. They've been uh, uh, trending down for about uh, 20 years. Now, Martin says that they're gonna stay low forever. Well, if they stay low forever, then we don't have a problem. If German 10-year yields yield one basis points from now on, and we will grow out of this. Any inflation and any growth will resolve this problem over time. So in fact, the risk is not that they're gonna stay low, the risk is that they're gonna rise, uh, which I think actually is a more plausible uh, proposition, but it's gonna take some time. So we talk about interest rates, and that's a problem. Then we talk about debt, and debts have, of course, exploded. And there are, I think, two reasons for why they have exploded. Of course, if interest rates are one basis point, then any reasonable person would borrow if they can find anything that the yields a return higher than one basis point uh, per year. So with low interest rates, everyone ha has borrowed. That's, that's, uh, that's quite, uh, quite reasonable. If you look at outlays, 
if you like, interest payments by governments and by the private sectors, they haven't changed very much in the last 10 years as debts have exploded because interest rates have come down. Now, some part of this debt is, of course, crisis-related there. And we have, uh, and as was mentioned here, we had this, uh, this collapse in asset prices in Spain and Ireland that led to a collapse in government revenues because the, uh, the tax systems were biased. Uh, they were highly loaded on to uh, 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 the building sector and so on and so forth. We had a problem with bailing out banks that led to huge increases in public debts. And we had a big slowdown that led to lower tax uh, uh, revenues. And that is, of course, a problem. But that problem is gradually going away. If we look at debt-to-GDP ratio uh, for, uh, for across the euro area, that peaked in 2014 at around slightly north of 90%. It's now down to a little bit uh, around 85% or so. We so just saw the graphs here from Ireland. Uh, for instance, the, the debt-to-GDP ratio rose from 20 to 120% is now down to 80%. So, so some of this is going away. So I'm not sure exactly how worried I should be about all of this, and that's really my, my question. And a quick question to, to Ludwig Schulknecht. Did I hear you right? Did you say that there had not been any austerity in Europe? <laughs> Good. If there are, y yes. David Pichler from the EVA. Um, my question is very specific in the economics uh, sphere. There's at the moment a very big debate about output gaps and how um, Mr. Mario you also talk, Haba, you talked about uh, fiscal rules and they're partly dependent on those output gaps. And in the literature, you actually find that they're very pro-cyclical and actually have fostered um, very pro-cyclical um, fiscal expenditure and so on. Um, how can we still use such a measure which has been found to be actually very um, against the targets of sound fiscal policy? And also the OECD makes those estimations. So would you still defend those output gap estimations and use them as a reliable indicator for fiscal policy? Okay, I suggest uh, we answer these three or four questions uh, now. Gottfried, do you want to start? Of course. Uh, okay, first of all, the safe asset. Um, well, I think there should be some kind of safe asset, but the design of the safe asset, uh, there are several alternatives to design it. Uh, I mean, if, if safe asset means uh, the classical euro bonds approach, I personally would be very skeptical about that because it, it leads to, internaliza as a, to, to externalization of, of uh, uh, unsustainable policies. But there could be a construction of a safe asset, for example, by aggregating assets from member states and so on. So I think, yes, there, there, uh, there should be some kind of safe asset, but uh, some smart kind of safe asset by aggregating risk. Um, symmetric rules. Well, coming from seven years of the Fiscal Advisory Council, I've always seen a deficit bias. Uh, in, in, in all the countries we observed and, and not the, the problem that excessive surpluses were incurred that might be um, subject to the economic situation we had, of course. Um, so in, in principle, um, I wouldn't see the need for symmetric rules uh, because it's a mainly a single bounded problem. Um, there might be... Uh, yeah, the issue to, to improve the, the measurement of, of expenditure, for example. So, uh, personally, I wouldn't be very much in favor of some kind of golden rule, but in uh, adopting uh, depreciations for investment. So, um, uh, better, better dispersing investment over time and, and being more yeah, uh, closer to private sector accounting. In, in kind of that. Um, the low interest rates, well, there's a risk for, for the public sector of interest rates, is, uh, rates rise, of course. Um, but on the other hand, the interest rates are the price for, as I tried to point it out, uh, presence and uh, the future. So uh, I see the interest rate problem related to the problem of assets for old age retirement. I see it related to uh, the distribution of wealth in an intergenerational issue. So um, if uh, liquidity uh, demand 
rises uh, at a slower pace than uh, liquidity supply, it might be a, uh, an issue we should observe. Um, and well, the output gap was a question for me as well. The output gap is, is uh, very hard to use for hands-on politics because it's subject to severe revisions, of course. And it was one of the concessions to be more flexible. So uh, it's for, for me, it's, it's the best example that flexible rules might be hard to, to target as an objective function, and ex post there might be revisions which are huge. So I think that we should focus on uh, simpler rules, of course, but that also means that, uh, it's, uh, that everybody himself is responsible for staying within the bounds of the simpler rules. So if, if you have less flexibility in the rules, it means you must create your buffers on your own. It's not forbidden to, to let's say, uh, not meet the MTO exactly, but you might uh, have a buffer in your plans as well. Thank you. Ludger, your go at the questions. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, safe assets are, of course, a prerequisite for a well-functioning financial system. The uh, question is a bit, what's the best way to get them? And um, is there really a problem? I mean, the US has the dollar. Um, we have in the Eurozone the Bund and the French government bonds and some other government papers which are very close to that in safe safety. So there's a lot of safe paper around. Um, the, the, the problem is, of course, exactly what I was describing, that in some countries, the fiscal situation and financial vulnerability start interacting that the national debt is not fully safe or is not perceived as safe anymore or could be seen by markets very quickly as unsafe. And then, knowing that, we start a debate whether we can get some safe asset that, so to speak, transcends this and creates a safe financing background for banks in countries that potentially have this problem. Um, I mean, apart from my skepticism towards financial engineering in this area, which would require probably some distortions uh, and subsidization implicit or regulatory preference for this to work, it's also a question whether it would really help the financial institutions in, um, in countries, in the, margin, in the problematic countries, if it, unless it goes to a very huge scale. So I'm not sure we have a problem. I'm not sure what is being discussed would solve it. Um, the second point was really on the issue of too much debt, to austerity, debt. debt if, you, if you take Germany out of the euro area debt, I, there has been very little movement in the last couple of years. Um, uh, Italian, French debt has been pretty stable, Spanish debt stable. So the high debt countries' debt ratios have been pretty stable. Portugal has done, gone down a little bit recently. Ireland is really the exception, not the uh, rule. Um, so, and, and no austerity, no, there was, auster uh, there was consolidation. I prefer to call it consolidation, but call it austerity if you wish during the pay phase of uh, destabilization between 2011 and 2013. But afterwards, my figures showed, in the last couple of years when the recovery was gaining momentum and countries would have had, so to speak, in the old Keynesian manner, an incentive to deal with some of the deficit problems, that's when it was not used. So that's, that's really the point I made. Uh, on the output gaps, yeah, this is, this is uh, a very tricky concept, and w we have done some analysis when I was still at the ECB, uh, and the overestimation of potential growth on average in the Eurozone between 1999 and 2017 was half a percent of GDP per year. So we had fantastically misestimated output gaps in 2007 in real time. Today, we are probably not that far off, but we may also be off. We don't know. I mean, um, in Germany, with, you know, some argue that potential growth is like 1.7% thanks to our migration. But I mean, from the inside, when, we were, when I was working there, we were basically saying a, a more realistic number is like 1% or maybe slightly above it thanks to the EU migration. So I'm, I'm sure that output gaps are poor guides, which leaves us 
in the fiscal area, to my mind, with a need for some nominal anchor. The 3% and the 60% are not the philosopher's stone, but you need a nominal anchor in the system, just like you need nominal anchors in the monet on the monetary side. If there are no uh, urgent further, well, maybe two. Let's, let's have two further questions. Back there, please. Tuukka Taipale, Ministry of Finance, Finland. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentations. Uh, I would like to hear the speaker's elaboration on the, on the fiscal risks of the banking union, particularly as regards to the common backstop of the single resolution fund and the European deposit insurance scheme. Thank you. Thomas van Kuipers, the Netherlands. Um, interesting uh, presentations and slides. I was uh, wondering about the last thing, the extension of um, physical barriers, basically, or barriers on based on physicality. Is that not a wrong incentive, uh, is my question to the last speaker. Um, uh, it feels like uh, promoting uh, bad matter in some sort of form by more and more of those barriers, more and more um, you try to limit other effects in the market, not, co uh, not uh, trying to um, uh, prevent the cause. Okay, thank you very much. So fiscal risk of banking union and capital controls uh, as wrong incentives. So who wants to talk it could on be, that? could yeah. be very short on that. I think if you have a common backstop, then you have to have convergence in the risk taking uh, of, of the banks. So that means uh, stricter rules uh, to have an even and balanced field of competition. Uh, so it's, it's, it's some kind of uh, conflict of the objectives. If, if you like one of those, you have to get the other. <laughs> so convergence is necessary, in my opinion, for a more integration and risk sharing. I, I, on this point, I broadly agree. I think we need the, the governance needs to be right. It's not a matter of, you know, do we, uh, is it right to have a single resolution fund or deposit insurance? But you know, it, you, you need to have the right governance where uh, uh, liabilities and authorities are aligned, and where we don't weaken, we don't, we shouldn't weaken the union. Uh, we should strengthen it. So, so it's a matter of of design. The single resolution fund is there, and I think the design framework is is broadly okay. Even though I think you know one could discuss that, but. With the deposit insurance, we are at the beginning of the debate, and uh, there it's, you know, just imagine politically, go b going back to 2015 when Greece, Tsipras was voted into office, and, you know, then uh, we had deposit insurance and the Greek banking system had gone bankrupt, basically, and we would have drawn the deposit insurance. I mean, what kind of political discussions we would have had in Europe? So, you know, you, you need to have a system that is not only incentive compatible in the economic sense, but also politically sustainable. And I mean, there are different uh, discussions, different uh, uh, opinions around, but uh, I mean, the governance is key. Yes, on the promoting of bad manners, of course. I mean, in a way, what I'm saying is, <laughs> given the low probability for political economy reasons that we will take care of the fiscal financial vulnerabilities in a preemptive manner, everywhere, in some countries we will, in others maybe not, we need to think about, you know, how in a preventive or preemptive manner, how we will deal with the resulting problems. Because I was in the Ministry of Finance in Germany when Greece and Cyprus came up and we suddenly had to think about capital controls and hundreds of billions of euros flowing into Switzerland and flowing into Europe, into Germany. I mean, now we have target balances of one trillion roughly, almost. You know, imagine in a new crisis, we'd have major dislocations. Again, it's a matter of economics, because if that money flowing out somewhere causes problems for the banking system typically, but maybe also for the fund industry, the asset management industry, life insurers elsewhere, and it causes problems in the inflow countries. So I'm not saying we should have, uh, we should, you know, 
prom promote bad manners. I think, you know, the OECD code for the uh, liberalization of capital accounts is meant to deal with exactly this, that if a country gets into the situation where it introduces, where it thinks it needs to introduce capital controls, that it then does it in the manner that it doesn't lead to a firestorm in capital markets. And this is in a way a sense of realism that we have in this area, and to my mind we should think about this in other areas as well. We have circuit breakers in the stock market, where when the stock market plunges by 10% or so, we have a trading stop. Ah, you know, I don't know, I don't know, I'm not an expert on bond markets, but maybe, you know, we get one day into the situation where we may think, ah, oh, you know, we, 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 we would need to have these kind of stops in, in bond markets. We discuss prolongations of government debt purely from the perspective of, oh, this is so terrible and, you know, uh, we, we, it, it's a bad sign and so on and it, the, the investors are going to hate it. But if you think about it, what has happened in terms of debt restructurings of government in the last couple of years, standstills were an essential part of managing the debate and managing the assessment of the situation and creating an orderly adjustment in the uh, respective government, debt market and, go and government. So uh, we have some elements here and there, but to my mind our discussion is, um, is too ideological on this and uh, too little systemic. Thank you very much uh, with us. Uh, I suggest we conclude the session. Uh, thank you to both speakers uh, for uh, your presentations and for your readiness to answer questions.